What's up everyone, Kenji here, and in this video I thought I'd give an overview of the private equity industry. So firstly, we'll start off with what is private equity, then we'll look at some of the ways that they make money, then thirdly we'll go over the investing strategies that they have, and then lastly we'll go over the career paths in private equity, looking at things like the work hours, the skills required, and the compensation. Let's go! So what is private equity? And in short, private equity funds raise money from outside investors and with the money they acquire companies and then they look to take a hands-on approach to improve their business and then hopefully in 5 to 10 years time they'll be able to resell it for a profit. Now the reason it's called private equity is because these funds invest in private companies. Sometimes they do invest in public companies but the goal is to take them back to private. Now if you don't know the difference between a private company and a public company, a public one is one that trades in the financial market. So that means that anybody can buy it, say I can go to my broker and buy Apple shares for instance because it's a public company. On the other hand, a private one is usually just owned by the founders, the management team and maybe a couple early investors. So it's not open to the public. Taking a macro view when looking at the different asset classes, private equity falls into the alternative investments category. So that's the same bucket as hedge funds, real estate and so on. So this isn't really an area that normal people invest their money in, instead it's usually just industry professionals. So some of the big investors usually include pension funds, sovereign funds, endowments, as well as high net worth individuals. In terms of risk levels, private equity is regarded as quite risky, and that's also why investors expect a high return for that. Now the reason it's risky is because one, you're trying to transform a whole business, so there's many variables to it, it might not work out and so on. And at the same time, it's regarded as an illiquid investment. So illiquidity is basically a measure of how easily something can be converted into cash. Now illiquid is at the bad end of the scale, say, so it takes a long time to convert. And among other illiquid assets are real estate, for instance, where there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of contracts required for you or anyone to be able to sell the real estate. While on the other hand, on the very liquid side, there's something like shares of Apple, Apple stock, for instance, where everyone is buying and selling, so it's very easy for you to convert into cash. So private equity is seen as an illiquid investment, mainly because you're investing in projects that last 5 to 10 years and you can't cash out before that. Now you may be aware that private equity sometimes gets a bad reputation, so let's look into why that is. And there's primarily two main reasons. Firstly, it has to do with the actual transformation or maximizing a business, right? And that often involves cutting costs. And among the big, biggest costs out there are salaries, so employees in this case. So that means that they have to lay off a lot of employees often, and that's something that gives them a bad reputation. At the same time, there's another reason, and it's that they're usually in there for five to 10 years trying to maximize their returns. So they're not really interested in whatever happens after a five to 10 years, because they don't really have any money to be made there, right? So that means that they can sometimes be overly aggressive. All right, so how they make money, and it's usually a combination of a management fee and a performance fee. And the industry standard is known as the 2 plus 20. The 2 stands for the management fee, so this is the fee for paying down the technology, the office space, employees and so on. And this one's fixed, so that means that even if they lose money or they win money, they're going to get the same amount. And then on the other hand, there's the performance fee. And this one's usually unlocked once they hit a certain, certain threshold. So for instance, once they sell the investment and they make a profit on it, then they can take it 20% off that. As you can see, it's quite aligned in that both the investors as well as the fund is going to be happy if they get good returns. Overall, the bigger the fund, the more exaggerated this 2 plus 20 structure becomes. A 2% of a 10 million fund might not sound like that much, but a 2% of a 10 billion fund obviously starts to become quite a lot of money. But overall, depending on the reputation of the fund, they might actually have a bigger structure than a 2 plus 20, so maybe a 3 plus 30, or a smaller one if they're not so reputable, like a, say, 1 plus 15, right? So within private equity, most funds specialize in certain investment strategies. As you can imagine, investing in a small startup is not the same in, as investing in a company with 1,000 employees, right? So let's look at some of the main ones. Here's a table showing a breakdown of some of the most popular strategies out there. So the first one has to do with venture capital, and this is the smallest investment size. It basically has to do with investing in startups. Now they're looking to hit home runs, so they're looking for massive returns that might happen once every 10 investments, for instance. So something like 500% plus. Ownership here is minority, so that means that they don't take control of the business. And examples of some of the big VCs include Sequoia or Anderson Horowitz. I did make a video just on venture capital. If you're interested in that, I'll leave it linked somewhere up here. Secondly, we have growth equity, and this one's sort of in between the venture capital space and the big leverage buyout space. So they're looking at companies that are a bit more established than startups. 
transaction amounts here are usually in the 25 to 100 million range and the home run is not really a goal anymore but rather getting steady returns of around the 30 percent mark ownership here is a bit in between the minority and the controlling position so they might have some influence on what they do with the business as well some examples of growth private equity funds include general atlantic or ta associates and lastly you have leveraged buyouts which are also known as lbos and you might have heard of this term being thrown around before this basically has to do with financing an acquisition of a company through debt primarily. So typically it's around 80% debt and only 20% equity. Now this is usually done in the context of taking a public company private. So the amounts are typically above the 100 million mark and the fund has full control of what they do with the company. Now the reason it's so attractive for private equity funds to use this leverage buyout method is because they use very little equity and a huge amount in debt which translates to really high returns because over say 5 to 10 years the company is able to pay off the debt and with it the equity returns just increase and so does the overall valuation as the company just keeps growing. Now going back to the fee structure, this is really how they maximize their performance fee. But it is obviously very risky, what if the company is unable to pay down the debt, they obviously have a problem then. So for LBO candidates, for leveraged buyout candidates, they look for companies with very stable cash flows that have a stable business model. So that means that with that cash, they'll be able to be paying down the debt throughout time. When it comes to companies with this kind of a strategy, the biggest ones are Blackstone and KKR. And there's obviously many other strategies out there like distressed debt or real estate, but I don't want to make this video too long. When it comes to careers in private equity, the traditional approach is to work at an investment bank or a management consultancy for around two to four years and then make the switch to private equity. Now the reason say investment banking analysts are so keen to get into private equity is for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the pay is usually better. Secondly, the work hours are usually slightly better. And then thirdly, it has to do with the work itself, which some, some people regard as just more interesting because you think of companies more strategically. I'd say having two to four years of experience is the most common way to get there, but there are an increasing number of funds that have summer internships as well as first year programs, so for people fresh out of college. An example of that is Blackstone. When it comes to the work hours, it's usually around 60 to 70 hours a week, which is slightly better than the 80 hours you might average at an investment bank or the 70 hours you might average at a management consultancy. When it comes to skills required, your bread and butter is going to be financial modeling. So finance and accounting as well as Excel are obviously big points there. And at the same time, being good strategically, so understanding a business model and how to optimize it. And then lastly, being able to communicate well, as you'll probably be talking with the management team of a company and you want to come across politely. Salary wise, you can expect to earn around 130,000 in base salary in a big US city like New York, say. But the big portion here is actually the bonus, which can double or even more than that. So you can expect to earn say around 300,000 depending on your performance as well as that of your team. Now these figures are for the top funds out there, but you also gotta keep in mind that they do have around two to four years of experience typically. So that means that they're not so junior anymore. Lastly, if you want to learn further about the topic, here's a couple things I recommend. Firstly, it's got to do with this book called King of Capital. I thought it was really insightful on the private equity industry all the way back from the 1980s to what it's like today with a special focus on Blackstone, which is the biggest fund out there. But if you're feeling a bit more lazy, there is also a movie which is called Barbarians at the Gate. And it focuses on the biggest leverage buyout back in the day, which was that of RJR Nabisco. And it is based on a real story where Henry Cravis was involved, who's one of the co-founders of KKR, which is still going strong today with around 250 billion under management. So that's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe, it really helps out. And I'll catch you guys in the next one.